The next item of business is topical questions. In order to get in as many members as possible, I would be grateful for short and succinct questions and responses. And at question number one, I call Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reports that less than a quarter of nursing shifts have enough staff. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. Presiding Officer, before I, I answer that question, can I just say what a fantastic time for reflection, incredibly powerful time for reflection uh, that was. It was a great honour to be sitting in the chamber to hear it. I am, of course, concerned about any uh, reports of understaffing within our NHS. The Government recognises the challenges associated with ensuring that health serv the health service has the right number of staff in the right place at the right time. Of course, we also recognise the demand pressures placed on our health service continue to be significantly exacerbated uh, by the impacts of the pandemic. The recently published National Workforce Strategy for Health and Social Care does set out how we are working to deliver workforce, uh, workforce recovery. Uh, that is on top of the 1,000 additional new healthcare support workers recently recruited and on top of the nearly 200 new international nurses uh, recruited with over 200 in the pipeline. Uh, the member will be aware that uh, NHS workforce statistics were published this morning. Uh, they show that NHS staffing levels continue to be at record high, including increases in nursing and midwifery. However, I am not complacent. I recognise that notwithstanding our best efforts, the NHS continues to face significant demand pressures, uh, and I welcome the conversations on safe staffing. Uh, and we will continue to, of course, have regular dialogue uh, with the RCN and other staff side unions on this important matter. Tess White. The findings of the Royal College of Nursing's last shift survey are shocking. Almost 70 per cent of staff in Scotland felt that safe and effective patient care was compromised on their last shift due to insufficient staffing levels. That is significantly higher than anywhere else in the UK. We have asked before with no clear answer, so let me try again. When will the Scottish Government provide a timeline for implementing the safe staffing legislation passed unan unanimously by this Parliament three years ago? Cabinet Secretary. I, I intend to publish a, a timetable on the implementation of the safe staffing elements of that Act uh, very shortly, uh, indeed, in, in, in fact, uh, uh, in the coming uh, month, I would hope. Uh, what I will say to Tess White, of course, is the RCN survey was a UK-wide survey uh, in relation to those concerns raised by uh, RCN members. Uh, the vast bulk of those members, of course, uh, would have come from England. So this is a, a UK-wide issue. There is no doubt that the uh, effects of the global pandemic have been UK-wide. Uh, what I would say uh, uh, to, to Tess White is that in Scotland we have a good track record of investing in our nurses. It is why we probably have more qualified nurses per 100,000 than other parts of the UK. We have 8.5 qualified nurses and midwives per 1,000 of the population, compared with 6.1 uh, in England. And as I say, we will make sure our staff, that we continue to invest in our staff, uh, and we will take forward that safe staffing element of the Act that she references uh, in a way that is considered, uh, but of course with pace, uh, as it is due. Tess White. The number of nursing and midwifery vacancies has increased by nearly 40 per cent in a year, with more than 6,200 vacancies currently open across NHS Scotland. And I repeat, NHS Scotland. The shortfall in registered nurses has written, risen to a record high under this SNP Government, while nursing and midwifery growth in Scotland is the slowest in the UK. The situation is so bad that the RCN has evidence students are being enlisted to plug staffing gaps, a potential breach of the law. Given this record shortfall, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with RCN Scotland that the SNP Green Government's plan to increase the workforce by just 1% over the next five years is totally inadequate? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, two things. I am engaging with the RCN later today. In fact, I am going to speak at uh, their Congress. But let us just put some of the facts uh, on the record. Uh, nursing, uh, the numbers of qualified nurses and midwives have increased by 13.7 per cent since this Government uh, came into power. Uh, nurses and midwifery student funded places have doubled to a target, uh, in, in, a target intake in 2022-23 of 4,837. Um, we have uh, plans, of course, in our workforce strategy uh, to ensure that we continue that in growth. And that 1 per cent that is referenced by Tess White is on top of uh, growth that we will naturally see. So I am not suggesting at all, uh, and I am not, certainly not dismissing at all, the, 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 the very serious concerns that RCN have raised. 
but our record on staffing is one that I'm very proud of. And in relation to vacancies, it would have been good if Tess White had read today's uh, workforce statistics, because they would have shown, of course, that vacancies in nursing uh, and midwifery have decreased since the last quarter. Julian Martin. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned some of the steps been taken to build an existing workforce set out in the National Workforce Strategy and the increase in staffing levels since 2007. But I would like to ask him what action this government has taken to continue to attract more people into the profession and what support is given to them as they undertake their studies, particularly in, in midwifery and uh, nursing. Well, again, uh, compared to the rest of the UK, I think we have a very attractive offer in relation to student, uh, students studying here in Scotland, particularly those that are studying uh, nursing and, and midwifery, not only in relation to the fact that they won't be paying uh, tuition fees up here in Scotland, but also, uh, of course, additional support in, in relation to that. I think um, Gillian Martin's first point is an exceptionally important one, particularly in uh, rural and island and remote parts of, of Scotland, uh, which is about the recruitment and retention. Uh, and, and while we are absolutely increasing the number of student-funded places uh, in relation to nursing and midwifery, as I've already referenced. Uh, we will recruit, of course, from the rest of the UK. But I think international recruitment also has a really key part to play in attracting people to remote, rural and island parts of Scotland. And I've referenced the fact that uh, we've recruited almost 200 uh, international uh, nurses, registered nurses. Uh, we have another 200 in the pipeline. And I'm working very closely with rural health boards to make sure uh, that that recruitment is not just a, a central belt recruitment, but a recruitment into, uh, that's evenly and, and widely distributed right across the length and breadth of Scotland. Paul okay. uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. The member survey by the RCN, coupled with the further statistics today showing record nursing vacancies in Scotland, are shocking. Nurses are at a breaking point, and there are reports of nursing staff walking off wards due to stress and pressure they are being put under. This comes after 15 years of this government slashing bed numbers, failing to tackle delayed discharge, and failing a nursing profession by cutting training places and presenting no meaningful workforce planning. When I put this issue to the Deputy First Minister at FMQs a few weeks ago, he said, we are working to ensure that we can address the issues that are of concern to members of the Royal College of Nursing. So with yet more deeply concerning evidence, what exactly is the Cabinet Secretary doing to address these extremely serious issues which threaten not only the well-being of staff, but the safety of patients? And isn't it time to offer nurses a proper pay award and decent terms and conditions? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, I'm addressing the RCN directly today. I'm meeting with them later uh, tonight. I will hear from them. I will be taking questions uh, and hopefully providing them uh, some reassurance to them answers. But that dialogue with the RCN uh, will continue regularly and with the other trade unions uh, as, uh, as it does right across uh, government and with other uh, trade unions. Um, he talks about record nursing vacancies. I've just, I don't know if you heard my response to Tess White, but of course, if you looked at today's statistics, they show that the vacancies have reduced since the last quarter. Uh, so we're moving in the right direction. Too high, I accept, absolutely fully, but moving in absolutely the right direction. And he talks about 15 years in government. Let me just remind him that in 15 years of this government, since we took over from his party, of course, Workforce in the NHS has gone up by 23.5 per cent, increased by almost 30,000 whole term equivalents. Nurses up by 13.7 per cent. Medical and dental consultants up by almost 60 per cent. We have the best paid staff in the entire UK, including in Labour run Wales. So we have a very strong record, which I'm proud to stand on in relation to investment in the NHS. And these challenges, which of course members are absolutely right to raise, are ones that have my full focus and full attention. Alex Cold Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the legislation we pass in this chamber is not worth the paper it's written on without the implementation to back that up. Safe staffing doesn't, isn't just about headcount, it's about skills mix and experience. We are losing those skills and we are losing that experience due to staff burnout. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, will he revisit the Liberal Democrats' suggestion for an urgent burnout prevention strategy? And will he also instruct today the creation of an NHS and social care staff assembly so that we can learn from the lived experience of staff on the front line? I will consider seriously uh, the point he makes around uh, a staffing assembly. And there are other ways in which we reach out to, to, to NHS staff, and I meet with them uh, regularly, but I will certainly uh, take on board his consideration. Uh, he has referenced the burnout strategy before, and I have often said to him we are investing record amounts in staff bill being £12 million uh, over the course of the, the, the last financial year. Uh, and, and I, I do not think it actually requires another bit of paper, another document to be drawn up. I think it just requires uh, action, which is what we are doing 
and what we're taking. But if he wants a broader discussion on wellbeing, as opposed to just uh, asking us to devise a strategy, I'm more than happy to arrange time to have that discussion. And, and I take his point fully about the implementation, and Tess White's points about the, the implementation of, of safe staffing uh, legislation. And that's why I'm committed uh, to publishing an implementation timetable uh, very soon. Julian Mackay. The RCN survey found that students and support staff are being asked to fill staffing gaps and undertaking the work of registered nurses. How will the Scottish Government work with health boards to ensure that all students and staff are aware of their rights and that there are clear channels for them to raise concerns if they are being asked to fill in for nurses inappropriately? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well I think that's a really important message by Gillian Mackay, and uh, I will reiterate that message when I meet the RCN, that if, of course, uh, any member of staff, including, of course, our hard-working uh, student nurses, student midwives, uh, if they have any concerns, uh, then those concerns, there should be an environment in their health board, in their uh, hospital or the community setting that they're in, that allows them to raise those concerns. But also what I will do, and I, I met with all the whistleblowing champions and all the health boards in Scotland recently, as well as the uh, uh, Independent National Whistleblowers Office, uh, and there was agreed action points that we think there's more that we can do with staff cohorts so that they know their rights in relation to whistleblowing. Uh, and, and I think we can incorporate and ensure uh, that, uh, that uh, students uh, right across uh, the, the medical and clinical cohorts are very much part of that communication strategy. Question number two, Katie Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I refer to my entry in the Register of Members' Interests to ask the Scottish Government, in light of recent reports, whether it will provide further information regarding existing ScotRail contracts with Abellio. Minister Jenny Gilruth. As part of the transition to a publicly owned railway, it was necessary for Transport Scotland to undertake a review of all existing contracts. It was identified that four existing Abellio contracts would be required to continue with ScotRail trains limited from 1 April this year to ensure consistency of service for passengers and to facilitate a smooth transition. Contracts retained include a Bellio Shared Services Centre for customer service calls and correspondence, payroll services and payment processing facilities, a Bellio Rail Replacement for the provision of planned and unplanned replacement bus and taxi services, advanced ventures for management of station tenancy and advertising management, and the bus link between Central and Glasgow Queen Street stations. Katie Clark. The information in the media came from a Freedom of Information request. Could the Cabinet Secretary inform the Parliament how much money is involved in these contracts? Minister. I am afraid I, I cannot disclose the financials involved in these contracts because they are commercially sensitive. However, I think she is right that public ownership of Scotland's railways needs to mean exactly that. And I think her question requires a level of contextualisation, presiding officer, to that end. First of all, it was prudent to carry over a limited number of contracts, whether delivered by Abellio or other suppliers, to maintain ScotRail services from day one of public ownership and to give that continuity of service for passengers and for staff alike. But it's also pretty common practice um, right across the UK in relation to the UK and Welsh governments uh, in relation to uh, practices that have been undertaken in the past. And secondly, there are only four Abellio contracts from the almost 200 suppliers that remain in place, and three of those have a, a one-year break clause point, which will allow for competitive alternatives to be looked at. So the approach taken has been a pragmatic one, but this is particularly pertinent, I think, when we consider the fourth contract, crucially, which secures, of course, jobs at the ScotRail Services Centre in Glasgow. Katie Clark. Thank you, and I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And perhaps she could reconsider some of the issues around about confidentiality and write to me in detail on that, given that this is fair payers and taxpayers' money that we are talking about. I hope she does agree with me that every penny of the money that we put into our railways should be put into the system and not leak out into the public sector. Could she outline whether there are any rail replacement services being provided by Abellio, given that we know that there are contracts relating to that, but there are currently a lack of rail replacement services? And could she give a commitment to look at that contract and the others with Abellio to bring them back in-house as soon as possible, as she's indicated, and give a timescale in relation to that? 
Minister. Uh, I thank the member for her supplementary question. She covers a number of points. So, uh, first of all, I just want to make clear that none of these contracts are a permanent feature of public ownership. Uh, and indeed, to that end, I have asked my officials at Transport Scotland to continuously review whether or not they are delivering best value for money. I think the point she made at the start of her question in relation to the benefit to uh, leaking out in terms of the finances here, um, I am sympathetic to the principle. However, we do need to consider that continuity aspect, which on the 1st of April was essential. There was a level of anxiety, of course, for staff and passengers alike on the 1st of April, so there was, I think at that time, there needed to be a level of continuity going forward. And the contracts themselves were reviewed at the point in which ScotRail came into public ownership on April the 1st itself. But more broadly, on her ask as we move forward with public ownership, as she knows, I want our trade union partners to have a vested stake, as do I wish passengers and staff alike, in Scotland's railways and what that vision will look like. And that's why we've committed to a national conversation on rail. She asked a question around about rail replacement buses, which does link to one of the contracts. And as she may be aware, ScotRail has confirmed that securing rail replacement transport at this time is significantly more challenging than it has been in the, the past. Now, that relates, of course, to a decrease in the number of available bus and taxi drivers, um, coinciding with another number of challenges, not least in terms of uh, the challenges the bus industry faces in relation to the COVID pandemic, but also uh, some of the challenges there have been compounded by the wider impacts of Brexit. So I'm happy to take her question more generally in relation to bus replacement to ScotRail. Um, she will understand that over the past couple of weeks I've been making these representations myself. There is a challenge here for ScotRail. I recognise that, but I'm happy to write to the member with more detail on the timescales associated with any delivery of further bus replacement provision. John Mason. Thank you. Uh, I think we all accept that a transfer like this uh, into the public sector will happen over a period of time. But can the uh, Minister uh, clarify how many staff are involved in these contracts? And obviously they will be a bit concerned about their futures at the moment. So can you give them any reassurance and that in future fair work principles and practices will certainly apply to them whether they're in-house or on contract? Minister. So the move to ScotRail Trains Limited has given stability for all ScotRail staff and this government remains absolutely committed to a policy of no compulsory redundancies. And the member asked uh, about the number of jobs affected. So the four contracts being retained have supported a number of jobs with around 160 being secured for the next three years at the Abellio Shared Services Centre in Glasgow. Both ScotRail Holdings Limited and ScotRail Trains Limited are required to comply with the Fair Work Convention 2015, the Fair Work Framework 2016 and the Scottish Government's Fair Work First Guidance. And that requirement is set out in the Framework Agreement and Grant Agreement, which underpins the new arrangements which came into effect on April 1. And Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, it really seems to me that we need full transparency here. So I think the Minister should be telling us what these contracts are worth and not hide behind uh, commercial, commercial sensitivity. Uh, and whilst she's thinking about that, could she also commit to telling us what the new Chief Executive and Chief Operating Officer are being paid out of the public purse? Because we don't know that either. Minister. No, the member is right on his final point. You don't yet know that, and you should know it. It should be in the public domain, and for clarity, it will be published in the coming weeks. I have had an assurance from ScotRail on that in relation to those salaries. In relation to the figures associated with these four Abellio contracts, and remember, there are a number of other contracts involved in this process, they are commercially sensitive. I'm not able to disclose that information in the Chamber today. However, I have undertaken to ask my officials in Transport Scotland to continuously review the contracts that are currently in place to ensure best value to the taxpayer.